Welcome to Houston Sports Talk with your host, Robert Land. Thanks for checking into the best Houston sports podcast. Robert, along with Sports Radio 610's Sean Bajani. And if you're new to the show, welcome to the party. And you're in good hands. 45 years in journalism between the two of us, over 35 covering H-Town sports. And Sean, I figured with the year 2022 just ending in the last few days, we'd have a little fun and do one last look back with our top five moments in Houston sports. And I, I'm going to imagine there's going to be a lot of overlap, but one team uh, did, couldn't help it because they gave us a ton of moments and the other two, they didn't give us much of anything. No, you're absolutely right. Like I was kind of struggling to uh, make this thing a little bit more uh, city friendly as opposed to just team friendly. But uh, the Houston Rockets and the Texans particularly made it very difficult. But I think I was able to rack my brain a little bit and come up with uh, – a couple of interesting anecdotes, but there's no doubt it's going to largely be dominated by the Astros between you and me, I think. Yeah, I, I, I think I know where you're going to start, but what was your number one Houston sports moment? I mean, the Astros winning the World Series, you know, just that moment, them winning the World Series. We could talk about, and I will, um, you know, what led up to that moment, but what it meant uh, for that organization, uh, for so many individuals um, within the organization, Dusty Baker obviously uh, getting his first World Series as uh, as a manager, uh, something that has eluded him. He's been there before, just never really able to cinch it up. And um, I, I think that was huge personally for him. But from the organization standpoint, you always want that that validation, I guess, for the lack of a better term. You know, the the hard work, the blood, the sweat, the tears that um, everybody's put into that um, organization from tearing it down to building it back up. You got the one in 17 and um, a little less about the, the cheating scandal, because I could give a rat's ass about that. But it's just, again, you have so many of the game's great players on one roster. You want that other one. You want to have Dynasty be a part of the conversation. And it certainly helped having now multiple championships uh, within the organization during this six-year stretch helps with that conversation. But then to the city, because the fans were mired in, you know, those conversations since that story broke uh, from The Athletic with Mike Fires about the cheating scandal and the whole bit defending the team, defending the players and defending the city, um, a city, you know, which is the fourth largest in the entire country, um, but always from a national perception had a much smaller um, feel. We were always like the bastard stepchild to, you know, New York or Chicago or Philadelphia or L.A., you know, all the other major cities in the country. And so I think for the Astros to be able to deliver a World Series championship in the fashion that they did, um, and then for the world to see how the city came together to celebrate, um, you know, the run and then to celebrate the championship, that was special. Yeah, I kind of wanted to narrow mine down to actually moments here with, with the Houston sports teams because as far as moments go, I'm going to put the Jordan home run as this moment of elation. It was kind of that moment where you feel like, hey, we're going to win this thing. And, you know, you might as well just make it a tie, though, because I, I had number two. I'll make it a tie. Uh, Kyle Tucker squeezing the final out, seeing Dusty Staff surrounding mm -hmm. him in celebration. And one split second, the monkey was off the Astros back and the monkey was off Dusty's back. And yeah, that's what. You know, I think about when you talk about that final out and, and in some ways it felt like it was off of my back as well. And, uh, you know, if you talk about the Jordan home run, like I said, I, I, this, this probably should be a tie for one. But that I'm talking about the game six, of course, of the World Series home run. It's interesting because, Sean, when the Astros won in 2017, there wasn't this defining moment from game seven, the deciding game. My biggest memory is just Charlie Mountain, Charlie Morton just mowing people down one after the other and may, maybe the final ground ball to Altuve, but it's more Charlie Morton just, you know, in a rocket chair, just delivering strikes and outs. 
Yeah, um, that's a good point, too, that you mentioned about uh, just that singular moment of Kyle Tucker uh, squeezing the final out on that uh, foul pop up down the right field line. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and, you know, qualify that is what I meant when I said the Astros won the World Series because I'm a dork. And I spent way too much time researching final outs of the World Series. And I had a lot of fun doing it because it brought back a lot of memories of me being a kiddo and watching some teams win the series and just, you know, having those dreams to be able to maybe one day do that, play in a game like that. Um, but after watching, you know, 100 years worth of uh, final outs in the World Series, I can do just maybe second best to what any analytical department or sports science department could do. I'll tell you just what I saw and witnessed with my own eyes. That was a special final out in the World Series to cinch it for Kyle Tucker because uh, to my knowledge, what I witnessed, I don't think a player ever traveled any further to make the final out of the World Series. And I would argue that that was probably the most difficult final out to make to cinch a World Series. He had to go quite a bit of ways uh, to make that happen. So just in that regard, yeah, I appreciate you bringing that moment up uh, for sure. Jordan's homer in game six to give that stadium, the viewers, the listeners, the city, the feeling that oh, we got this. This is ours. That was it. That moment was it because it, it just reinvigorated our faith in what the Astros' bullpen had been able to do all season long, all postseason long. If somebody had just given them a chance, Jordan did in that moment, and you knew if you were going to give the ball to Ryan Presley or anybody out of that pen, you were going to be good. So, yes, for that moment to give the city that hope, that feeling of – euphoria that man this was destiny the Jordan homer in game six was it certainly and they did it at home in front of the home fans I mean, yeah that's a big part yeah yeah and what was that the first time that a world series was won in front of their home fans in like what it was, it was something like close to 15 20 years wasn't it oh i didn't even see that is that right i am it, it was the first time in a while yeah i now you're going to make me go back and look it up. But I wanted this 13 was coming to my mind. So I think that was maybe the first time in 13 years or something like that. It doesn't happen on the regular, at least here in recent history. All right. I want to get your second moment, but I want to remind everybody that's watching and listening to this, uh, put in our YouTube comments what your favorite moments are. I want to hear your top five. If we missed any or if it's something a little bit different, you got them in a different order. Let's hear you. It's the best way to support the show, too. Make sure to subscribe. Watch our final live Texans postgame show after the Texans Colts Sunday. It's going to be some big picture conversation with the Texans. So you're going to want to tune in. We're not going to dwell too much on that game itself. But um, also, and if you listen to our last post game, you heard a ton on what we thought about Bryce Young and CJ Stroud. Go back and listen. It's not us going over every single play of that game. So you're going to hear about their performances on Saturday, what that means for the Texans et cetera, et cetera. And look for all the live shows under the live tab on our YouTube page. You can always listen on your favorite podcast app as well. And Sean, let's get to your second biggest moment. I, I told you mine. What's yours? Well, I'll, it's my de facto two now. I, I did have it as my three since I gave the Astros that singular moment of winning the World Series, Jordan's Homer in game six. Uh, I guess now my de facto number two moment. Don't worry, I'll have a fifth for you when we get to that point in time. But <laughs> it has to be uh, it has to be none other than the Jordan walk off against the Seattle Mariners um, in game one. You know, we talked about Jeremy Pena setting the table uh, all postseason long. And it was actually Alex Bregman who maybe draped the tablecloth over in the eighth inning with a two run shot. And then Jeremy Pena, you know, has that great at bat setting the stage for Jordan Alvarez um, to give the Astros that um, important victory in game one. That series particularly, you know, it was a sweep, but damn, that was a hard sweep. That's a really good team. And you knew the Mariners could possibly be a problem for you in the postseason because in playoff baseball and playoff football and playoff basketball, anything can happen. It's the playoffs. 
And damn, the M's gave the Astros a good run, really, all through that series with some phenomenal games, phenomenal pitching, and just clutch performances. And what was bigger than Jordan being able to walk that bad boy off and get things started off right for the Astros on their trek to a second World Series? Exactly. I mean, for me, it was number three, but like I said, well, I might as well just have the other two tied at, at number one. And what it meant for us is you you sensed at that particular moment, hey, maybe destiny's on our side. Maybe this is the Astros year. And it, as comebacks go in the in, in, in Houston sports history, it doesn't get much better than that one. I mean, we, we could start going through the list and it, it feels like uh, all the comebacks that I can remember are, are reversed. The the Astros or the Rockets or the Texans took the took the L in the comebacks. Ah, oh, there's no question, man. Um, you know the the Astros. The fact that you know we're we're about to be to number three, and we've gone back and forth with really three different kinds of moments and what was important to us in particular plays. Um, that just goes to show you just how special this ball club really um, was in 2022 to the city. Uh, but is to the city um, in its history. Just baseball in this city is incredibly special and romantic, and it's always going to be, I think, the bond. Um, and if there's ever a conversation um, at any point in time in the very near future um, about this being any other kind of town other than a baseball one, you're wrong. All right. So what's next on your list? And I've lost track now. Is this your third or your fourth one? I can't remember. Let's go. Let's go. Well, this would have been my fourth, but <laughs> it's now my third. Um, the Astros World Series no hitter. It, anytime you make history, that has to be in a top five list. And, you know, in, in that moment, you know, with Christian Javier and everybody that factored into that, that incredible performance by the Astros in dominating fashion. Um, it was special. And what we came to find out after, you know, when the Astros won the World Series and the bats kind of came alive at the right time after being so cold, maybe the impetus for that was Michael Brantley, who's coming back now, um, you know, in hopes of actually playing and being a contributor to maybe another Astros World Series championship. But Brantley gathered the guys up around the batting cage, you know, ahead of uh, game four, I believe it was, and said, hey, man, you know, we need these bats to come alive. And sure, hey, the bats came alive. But guess what? So did the arms. And they went out and put out a historic performance, something that you hadn't seen since 1956 with Don Larson in a World Series. Um you know, throwing a no hitter in the fashion that they did. Nobody has a flair for throwing combined no hitters like your Houston Astros. I think they have probably the most combined no hitters um, of any team in Major League Baseball history. And if it's not the top, it's certainly a close number two or three that I can remember. But it's, it was just tremendous. It has to be the no no. Yeah, because I was going for moments. I didn't put the no hitter in. Maybe it's just because I just expected it at that point. I just thought, okay, they, they've got this game. And to me, it was more important the game than the no hitter. So my next moment, my number four on the list, I'm going to go eh, the next game. Chaz McCormick, the catch, catch, game five of the World Series. Oh, my. I mean, we're talking about not just this is one of the great catches of all time, not just in Houston sports history, in World Series sports history just unbelievable and i was so happy as a, as a jazz fan who felt like you know this guy's been a little disrespected by dusty he won't put him in the lineup he's scared to put him out in center field and you know his defense is not that good and then guess who makes the catch Chaz? and you feel like hey i was right uh i i, I got that thing right and guess what the astros <laughs> might have just won this game and it, it felt as pivotal as a game in that series as there was. I mean, the no hitter, obviously game four, the Astros absolutely needed that game, but game five, you felt like maybe the winner of the series is whoever wins this game. So getting that game, you're just like, okay, we got it now. We, 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 we might, we might, we might have this one. Um, even though we've been through it a couple of years before where the Astros did blow two at home, but I'm like, eh, I don't think it's going to happen again. Yeah. Yeah. Now my apologies for violating the rules once again about moment. Um, Whoever made the last out for that World Series, there you go, because you solidified a combined no-hitter. Do you remember who made the final out? 
Oh my goodness, you're stumping me. I'm trying to rem- see. That's why I didn't. That's why I didn't have it on the list because it just didn't quite. St- I'm like, uh, yeah, hey. I remember the no hitter, but who who was the one? That, I mean, maybe I'm a bad Astro fan, but I can't remember who yeah, did that. Right don't, don't ask me. I'm. A, I was asking you because I, I don't know, and that was kind of my point. You know, for the way that my mind was working today, and quite honestly, how it works most days, it's really hard for me. You know, when so much time has elapsed and it's been you know about a month and a half and change now. To, to really pick out those particular moments. And you do such a great job at that. But I don't know who made the final out of the, uh, the no-hitter in that, in that World Series game. I'm going to Google that one, too, whenever we're done with the podcast. But And one of our you know, commenters want to you know, do that, absolutely. But um, there were so many really, really great plays that stood out with the Astros along this run. You know, there were some great plays by Jose Altuve in the World Series when he wasn't swinging the bat, him ranging to his uh, right and spinning and throwing. And it was like, man, you know, don't bench this guy. Don't talk about moving him anywhere in the lineup. Like, that's that's just what he does. If he can't contribute at the plate, he's going to do it in the field. And I'm glad he did it on a national stage because not a lot of people realize uh, his range and throwing ability. And now I think even some fans were reminded – about just his overall athleticism as a player. When things aren't going good, the guy's still going to contribute. Yeah, you can define your moment any way you want to. I told Sean before we start, I'm like, yeah, it's, you know, if you want to make it a day, if you want to make it a game, whatever you want to do, if you're out there listening to this, watching this, however you want to define it. So I've got one more on my list. I've got number five. What's the next one on your list? Pain your power. Jeremy which, Pena, which one? Which pain your power are we talking about? The Yankees game? Well, I I violate, you know, another rule, but I mean, there's so many. It was hard for me to really decide. I, I just I, I kind of dumbed it down to, you know, Pena's um postseason. And if there was a particular moment, um, you know, for him, what was it? Uh Man, what was it? Uh, the World Series. He did so much before that World Series. Even in the Mariners series, I'm trying to think. He had a big home run. Wasn't it against the Yankees in yeah. the postseason? That the, was... the, the Yankees one is the one that I specifically remember. Yeah, um, and that yeah. has to be mine, I guess. You know, gun to my head, in my memory, you know, I, I have to jog it a little bit. But Pena had a comparable regular season to the one that Carlos Correa had in Minnesota. Right. Um, especially having caught a little bit of fire late in the regular season, bumped up those numbers a little bit. But throughout the regular season, he played really good defense. You know, yes, he needs some improvement on, you know, some of the more fundamental basic type of plays at shortstop. But he made some spectacular plays throughout the course of the regular season. And there was constant comparison. Oh, Pena to Correa, Pena to Correa. Hey, you know, what about this? It comes down to the postseason. What were going to be his moments in the postseason? Well, that was just the thing. He had multiple moments, Robert. I mean, he was the table setter. That was like his moniker, his nickname that we'd kind of given him, you know, after some of these post-game conversations. You couldn't have one without talking about a great at bat by Jeremy Pena, another great play at shortstop by Jeremy Pena. What a fantastic job to come from behind in the count and work a walk. What a fantastic job to get a sack fly. What a homer in such a clutch moment. You know, those are the things. And so, yeah, it's one year, but that's the impetus of the legend of Carlos Correa uh, with the Houston Astros. It started with one performance, one swing of the bat, one play ranging to his right and throwing to first. Jeremy Pena kind of solidified, you know, himself as – a star with this Houston Astros team and not that he's going to be the next Carlos Correa, but maybe he's going to be the first Jeremy Pena. This is where you're supposed to hold up your sign that says, marry me, Jeremy uh, up on the screen for us. That's I'm outnumbered. Like, I'm outnumbered. <laughs> you know, all those at the parade in the parade route beat me to it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, my number five and you know, I could have gone Astros all day long. Uh, but the, these are significant. These are like bigger moments for the city of Houston that I picked at number five. The elation may not be Astros elation, World Series elation, but th- this is pretty big elation for a couple of important teams in Houston. The Rockets landing the third pick in the lottery. That's the first part of my tie. 
you'd have hated for them to have the worst record in the NBA and fall out of the top three in a draft that had a pretty defined top three. So you wanted to be in that top three. You did not want to fall out of that with the three guys being Jabari and Paolo and Chad Holmgren. And you felt pretty good if you could just stay there in that top three, which they did. And I love that they got Jabari. He was my favorite of those three. I might be wrong. It, it was so close and I liked all of them, but I, I love that they got Jabari. That one is tied for me with, and Sean's going to love this one, the Houston Cougars getting a long overdue invitation into the Power Five. Welcome to the Big 12 Cougs. Houston is a relevant city in college football for the first time in 30 years. That's why it's a moment. Yeah, I thought you were going to – all right, that's a really good pull. I thought you were going to go with the uh, Cougar basketball team being ranked number one for the first time in 40 years since Phi Slamma Jamma's birth uh, with Olajuwon and those guys. But Yeah, uh, they, they had a couple of them, but I, I was like, man, this one matters more long-term. It, it, it absolutely does, and unfortunately – um, there are questions about, you know, the staying power in terms of that relevancy um, with, you know, regard to the the ever changing landscape of college football and these conferences. You know, what is a power five conference? Is it going to exist, you know, in three more years? You know, is it going to be, you know, what? it's like a power six, a power eight, you know, a power three? Like, I don't know all these programs you know, moving all over the place. But I will say this, I'm going to enjoy it for a couple of years uh, that I do believe Oklahoma and Texas have remaining within the Big 12. I'm looking forward to some, you know, matchups with those guys from a baseball standpoint, basketball standpoint, certainly a football standpoint. I don't know what the menu looks like for the 2023 season, but I'm certainly, you know, anticipating some really good football, um, just an influx of dollars, of eyeballs on the program, of improved facilities, improved um, recruiting classes. I just hope, you know, and I know we're talking about football here, but that Dana Holgerson particularly um, kind of upon returning to a familiar conference that he's coached in before, uh, most recently with uh, West Virginia a few years ago before coming to the University of Houston again, um, that that he can kind of recapture, you know, some of that, um, that, that allure, that magic, I guess, if you will, for the lack of a better term, and really hit the ground running and get some great recruiting and turn this program into a real strength that I don't, that it really hadn't been since, you know, uh, under Kevin Sumlin's um, leadership as head football coach. Yeah. And you said football. And for me, it's 99% about football. The Cook basketball team did not need this. The Cook football team desperately needed it and how about the year ending for the cougars yeah. with tcu getting a spot in the championship game your future big 12 conference rival opponent whatever i mean that tells you as the cougars you go well it's not the best conference in you know college football but guess what we got a rep here that's about to play for the national championship sean that, that's a great point that's a great point it does nothing more than you know solidify that um, status for the Big 12. I, I was really proud of TC. I mean, look, it's a Texas school, you know, um, and you want to see Texas schools uh, do well. And, you know, um, normally I would relegate them to uh, southern Oklahoma portion of Texas, but I, I do tip my cap to them for uh, representing the state well and, and doing that. And I look forward to it, man. I mean, this is – I don't think we can really imagine – just yet, Robert, what real impact this is going to have, what it can have really on the program, the university, which has done so many things without even needing to be a part of the Big 12, the the, the jobs that they've done with the number of their schools and getting more dollars and people and um, prestigious and brilliant minds over there to work for the University of Houston with the development of their medical program the enhancements of the communication department, uh, what they've done at the business school. I mean, it's just countless efforts and the job that Rena Couture has done with, you know, the support financially 
um, and, uh, Tillman Fertitta and so many other uh, donors, many of whom have made massive contributions here in the last decade that are anonymous. I'm really looking forward to the future at U of H inside the Big 12 across the board, athletically and academically. And I know everybody's out there, they're going, well, what about this? And what about that that happened in Houston in the last year? And yes, my honorable mention, because I wrote them down, mm -hmm. Astros no hitter at Yankee Stadium, Christian Javier, again, did it. You don't even have to include that one because that's how good the Astros year is. U of H, what a good year they've had. We didn't include them beating the number one seed Arizona in the Sweet 16. That was nice. How about Damian Pierce? breaking 357 tackles in that unbelievable run against the Jags. How about Houston legend Simone Biles' courageous Olympic bronze medal and the beam performance after basically losing her equilibrium and having to withdraw from the women's all around to come back and do that. The courage of Simone Biles chokes me up every time I talk about it. That, that was some of my honorable mention, Sean. I think great honorable mentions. Uh, Damian Pierce, you know, that rumble in Jacksonville, maybe even go before that, the 75-yard run, which was really his – people called it his breakout performance. But I felt like, you know, he had he had a couple 20-yard runs, you know, making guys miss tackles within the first couple of weeks where you should have said at that point in time, you didn't need a 75-yard touchdown run to do so. But you see a great 20-yard run, you know, the fierceness, the tenacity, the physicality, um, the raw athletic ability by him uh, within the first, you know, week, two weeks of the season. That's a franchise running back. And so you just hope that he has a great offseason and comes back healthy and he's being handed the ball off from a franchise quarterback named Bryce Young uh, in 2023. So I'm looking forward to that one. That was a great pull. Simone Biles, fantastic um, you know, career that she's had and never ceases to amaze delivering um, epic moments, uh, just one on top of the other, man. She's a tremendous athlete. And um, by the time that she's all done, um, you might want to make some room for her on the uh, Houston Mount Rushmore, which is this day and age, uh, we're blessed. It's getting quite full up there. I don't want to forget the Houston Dash, because I was at their first ever playoff game. I don't want to forget. Now, this wasn't a moment maybe for everybody, but, man, there was a lot of people out there. This is just about everybody in Houston. Anybody at the parade, there was some moments there. There were some goosebumps. When you saw the guys come by with that trophy, it was special, Sean. I, uh, you know, I wasn't able to be there. I tried to live vicariously through all the coverage on social media and television and stuff like that. But you talk about the goosebumps. I'll never forget, uh, you know, being a 12 year old kid, being downtown in front of that iconic, I think it's the Smith street parking garage where people just pour out of when there's parades in town and just the confetti pouring down. I'll never forget the fire station coming by with Kenny Smith on top of it. It was him and Sam Cassell hoisting the Larry O'Brien trophy and I was in tears. <laughs> you know, I was uh, in tears. I'm jumping up, taking pictures with my Polaroid camera. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. Just trying to get a glimpse. And so watching the reactions and, you know, living those moments on television with the million plus fans downtown that were uh, just in elation watching our baseball heroes drive by us right before their eyes. It was, it brought back all of those memories. And I can only imagine, you know, I probably would have been in the same state as a 40 year old man. If I would have been downtown live and in person, just as you were Robert, as I was when I was 12 years old, I would have probably been in tears and I probably would have wanted to consume multiple alcoholic drinks at 10 30 in the morning after having done so. Absolutely. Uh, hey, next up, I thought we'd hit our three favorite sports moments in 2022 with no Houston connection. And I'm going to make it easy because I'm going to start with, for me, this is a layup. Maybe I should call it an open net goal because it was Messi and Mbappe, Argentina versus France, the World Cup final. No question. My number one. We just we talked about that in the Texans post game a couple of weeks ago. Unreal. Like that, that's going to go down as one of the great just events of anything non-sports, non-Houston sports 
in my lifetime. That's your number one nationally. Are you going, yeah. are we going one, two, three. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's a really good one, you know, and I know you have an affinity for, for soccer. Um, you know, I, I, I do like it. I loved it better when I was playing, but I do have an appreciation for, you know, the game's greats in those special moments um, like that. So yes, that was, that was tremendous. My number one, I'll dumb it down for you because again, I violated, you know, one of your rules. I, I didn't go specific moment, but in this case for my number one nationally, I went a two day chunk, a period of time. The greatest football I've ever witnessed in my lifetime occurred this past January, you know, with the Packers and 49ers game on Saturday, which was tremendous football to watch, you know, that old, low scoring, gritty, you know, type of football that you saw in weather. And it didn't think it was going to get much better than that, but it did by like a hundredfold on Sunday. After the uh, Rams beat Brady and the Bucks, you remember Brady leading the Buccaneers down the field time and time and time again, 24 unanswered points, and the Rams get a 30-yard field goal from Matt Gay to end that ball game and crush Brady and the Bucks' dreams last postseason, only to be topped by literally the most thrilling sporting event I've witnessed in my life and may never again, the Kansas City Chiefs and Buffalo Bills Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes going tit for tat, tit for tat, 25 total points combined scored by both of those guys in the game's last two minutes. That was the best football game I've ever seen in my life. And if anybody else seen a better one, you know, send me the link on YouTube and I'll go and check it out. I got to see it uh, because that was tremendous. And so that singular game and that moment in which, you know, Patrick Mahomes, you know, did what he does. Found who else? Kelsey for the score, <laughs> you know, with a few ticks left on the clock. I mean, how did it get better than that? That's That's got to be mine. Yeah, you're going – you're combining those two. I, 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 my memory is much more of the Bills Chiefs. That's what I – that's actually my number three moment. Go. And, and I, you know, I, I thought it was 31 combined points in the last two minutes. That's what I read because I couldn't remember exactly right. So I don't know if it was 31 or 25, but it doesn't matter because it was nuts. Wow. And and it, it I don't I can't imagine we'll ever see a more incredible last two minutes of action in an NFL game ever. I just can't imagine it. No, there's. I, I, hey, you know what? If if it's on deck, I'm here for it. <laughs> you know, but <laughs> I, how do you outdo those two performances by those individuals in that magnitude of a game? Um, it's and, that, just, and it was just as good. It was as good of a weekend in the NFL. There were four games that weekend that were all awesome. It was great. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know who knows what you have on tap for this postseason? Because Robert, I feel like, I really feel like in in the NFL, it gets better every year that goes by, and the the talent that we have at our disposal, at our fingertips. And that we get to sit on our couch and watch in front of the TV screen every single Saturday or Sunday or Thursday or Monday, whatever it is. I mean, it's tremendous. And um, if if they haven't done it by now, the NFL needs to go ahead and write in contractually, make a mandate that Patrick Mahomes, Josh Allen, Tom Brady, which I think they probably did Brady about 20 years ago. He has to be in playoff contention every single season. If not, there's a massive violation of the uh, CBA and he's going to be fined heavily. <laughs> and whatever team he's playing for at the time is going to cost him draft picks. I need to see all these guys and I don't think we're going to have any problem. They've got a lot of great football left in them for us to enjoy. Yeah. Patrick Mahomes. Ugh, he's just, he, he's such a thrill to watch every single time. And just, I, you feel like you're watching something special. So, so I've told you my one and three, my number two, I'm, I'm guessing this is not on your list. So I'm going to go ahead with my number two and my, my last of the three. Um, and this was my number two, because I am a sucker for Rudy or Hoosiers or Rocky stories. And the best one of the year was the Kentucky Derby. The impossible happened at Churchill Downs, 80 to one rich strike 
The longest shot of them all came out of nowhere. The play-by-play voice on the telecast didn't even know Rich Strike was making a run until the final few furlongs. It surprised him at the last second. The only reason Rich Strike was in the race, Sean, was because of a scratch by another horse the day before the Derby. I don't even know how many times I've watched the replay, but the race is still on my DVR. I loved it. Yeah, that's all. Well, you know, for nothing else, just the call. Because, you know, horse racing calls are some of the greatest calls in the history of sports. They're so exciting uh, when you have a fantastic race on the big stage that everybody pays attention to. Um, You know, if it's the Kentucky Derby, the Belmont Stakes, the Preakness, whatever the case may be. But certainly the Kentucky Derby just um, it's I I don't think it's crazy to say some of the most entertaining and fun and exciting calls in sports sometimes come from the. Uh, horse racing announcers and that was certainly uh, one of the best ones I I thought he was going to screw it up because he he didn't see it coming and I'm like wait a second this other horse is in and I didn't realize that that was the longest shot that was coming on because they basically had ignored him the whole race and you had to watch the the reason I had him on my DVR you have to watch the race two or three times just to go how did he do that you know, because you're looking and he was at the back at the beginning of the race. And for most of the race, he was like, you're the back of the pack. And he just comes, I don't know. It was, yeah. Like, ah. hey, you know, if I knew the answer to this, I would, uh, you know, succeed your number two uh, with this one. Whoever the hell bet that horse and won a bleep ton of money deserves to be like number two on this list. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Especially if it was part of like a trifecta or something like that. 80 to one odds. I mean, I'd love to, you know, uh, uh, borrow like a hundred bucks from somebody and be able to put some money down on that horse finishing one, two, and three with whoever else finished two and three on 80 to one odds. Like, can you imagine what the trifecta odds would have been on their top three or top four? Uh, superfecta, maybe. Go superfecta. Um Borrow $100 uh, and I'll, I'll pay you back next time, man, because uh, I'm, a, I'm a sucker for the underdog and I wish I would have had some cash to lay down on that dude. You have two left. Is that right? You have two yeah, more? Yeah, I have two left. Um, and I'm actually going to switch it up. I, for my number two, I had Rams beating the Bengals uh, in the Super Bowl, which I, I thought was a tremendous game. I'm a big Joe Burrow guy, but scratch that one off the list, man. I'm going to go ahead and move my number three up to number two. And I'm going to go Serena Williams' retirement in her final tournament played, I I had never been more captivated um, by a tennis match as I was watching her play for the final time in her career. Um, And, and, you know, look, I'm not going to sit here and say, like, I'm a big tennis fan per se, because I'm not going to watch your just average tournament on a Saturday afternoon. Um, But, Hey, if the French Open is on, if the U.S. Open is on, if the Australian Open is on, if Wimbledon is on, your majors, uh, your Grand Slam tournaments, you know, stuff like that, I'm there for it. Um, And I followed her career since the time, like a lot of other people, since she was a teenager. And, you know, I was young and I was just marveling at the athleticism and the poise and the way that this young uh, you know, black woman was carrying herself um, and was was just revered by all. And people were just in marvel of her ability and her sister Venus and the fact that there was two of them in the same family. They were so dominating uh, for so long. I, I was just drawn by that. And to be able to say that you lived during the same time and you got a chance to witness um, much of her greatness, albeit, you know, through a a, a television uh, most of the time. I mean, it it was, it was fascinating. I'd never been more captivated at a tennis event than that. It's funny. You mentioned that because I made a note of just the massive sports retirements in sports last year. And I want to get back to that Serena uh, retirement in just a second, but we had coach K uh, Rafael Nadal, Albert Pujols, WNBA star Sue Bird, Rob Gronkowski, NASCAR legend Jimmy Johnson, and of course we just had JJ Watt. And and just going back to the Serena retirement, yeah, I thought about that a little bit. But the thing about the Serena retirement and the Coach K retirement, Sean, and I guess we're on different pages on this. It was I'm I'm watching it night after night, and it gets to be 
a little bit too much because it's just every single night, you know, they're making a big deal out of it. And because it's at the U S open to me, the cool factor, you know, I, I live here in Montrose. So it's about the cool factor for me. The cool factor was Rafael Nadal's retirement and nobody watching it except the people that, you know, realized it was on the tennis channel and it, it and here's Rafael Nadal, you know, out there giving a speech and in t- this guy that you see no emotion from him. He is as blank faced usually as it gets in sports. And this guy is shedding tears and you see Nadal, his biggest competitor, mm-hmm. one two of the great rivals in all of sports history, also in tears and playing with him in his last. I mean, that to me was so much cooler you know, us hanging out at the uh, used bookstore with our, uh, you know, cool, you know, 70s style shirts on and stuff like that. We thought that was the the, the cooler retirement was uh, Nadal. Yeah. Um, you know, Nadal, Nadal's an, another one, to, you know, to be honest. I mean, not, 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 I'm sorry, not Nadal. I, I meant to say Federer. I think I screwed all that up, but yeah, Federer. But yeah, I, at first I said Nadal, but yeah, it was the Federer retirement. Yeah, but yeah. Federer. But, you know, the, the Nadal, Federer, Djokovic, you know, that trio, I mean, when when one of those guys, you know, hangs it up, calls it a career, it, it loses its luster, you know, from, from a watchability standpoint, because you look forward to seeing some of those epic matches and stuff. And so, yeah, Federer hanging it up, um, you know, it's... It just does that for me, you know, for how long, what, 15, 20 years, maybe longer than that. How long have we been, you know, wondering when the U.S. particularly is going to have that next great tennis player to rival, um, you know, the likes of uh, of those guys internationally from, um, you know, Great Britain or France or Italy, wherever it is, who's going to be that guy from the U.S. that can kind of take us, grab our attention, and we can go for that ride along like we did with Venus and Serena. You know, where's going to be that male figure? And that, that's going to kind of be the next question as it's been really for uh, a number of years now. But just because of the sheer, you know, gravitational pull that that Serena had from non-tennis fans, people that just knew who she was, knew what she did, knew she was a big deal. Like you, you just want to see her or some people that, that just have that aura about them. You want to see them in their element. And she created tennis fans like Tiger Woods created golf fans. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You know, and, and that's what it really was for me. And so that final singular moment, the reaction by the crowd, Forget everywhere it was, you know, the U.S. Open in New York. I mean, it's great. I mean, what better stage, like, from an American, you know, standpoint to be retiring in the U.S. Open in, in, in you know, the biggest city in, in the country. I, I love that moment. I love the outpouring of, 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 of respect, of love and emotion, you know, from the fans. Um, and the coverage was very, very well done. I know we got to wrap it up soon. And I know everybody's talking about this DeMar Hamlin story. It's been pointed out all the Texans who played with him, Kurt Heinisch in high school, Jimmy Morrissey in college and Jerry Hughes and Mario Addison with the bills and Sean, I'm sure they're all deeply affected, but there's one Texan I thought of most when I saw what happened, Derek Stingley. I'm surprised his name hasn't been brought up more. Of course, his grandfather, Daryl was paralyzed by an NFL hit on the field. I can't imagine there are many more players who are connected with Demar Hamlin that might look at this as differently and as uniquely as Stingley. Uh, it's a great point, man. And you know, uh, Daryl Stingley, uh, his grandfather, as you mentioned, paralyzed on a football field. I can't remember what year that was, but in the in, in the history of sport, that goes down still to this day as one of the most severe, gruesome uh, tragedies that occurred um, on on a sports field or court anywhere. Um, And, you know, Derek is not a guy that I even saw in the locker room today. And I have to be honest with you while I was uh, hosting on sports radio, 610 over the course of the last couple of weeks, various shows. I can't tell you the last time I remember seeing Derek Stingley out in the locker room, um, you know, and available to the media. I mean, it's been weeks upon weeks uh, to be honest with you. And he's a guy that's not very comfortable with the media, uh, in general yet. 
um, I think, you know, that along with a lot of other things will improve. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very good point, um, you know, why more people aren't talking about that. But I think people, you know, are so just caught up and, uh, you know, kind of attached to what we all witnessed, what most of us, I think, probably witnessed in the game of the year on Monday Night Football. Just we got a chance to see five minutes and change of it. We, we, we watched a guy die, you know, on the football field and was brought back to life. And, um, you know, even at the, with, with that happening, you didn't know that that was happening. You know, the information, the way that it was disseminated throughout the course of, you know, those few moments and the rest of that night. I mean, it was kind of a trickle down effect. And um, we were just left with many, many more questions than answers. Uh, for the next 24, 36 hours that we experience this. And even still right now, some encouraging signs from this morning. But um, I think our attention was so much on that and DeMar Hamlin's health and well-being and just praying for him and wondering, you know, my God, you know, how do his teammates, how do his coaches, how do the people that, you know, have these close relationships that experience, um, you know, his fellowship, um, and passion every single day. How do they deal with this? You know, how do they go forward? Um, and, you know, you mentioned Jimmy Morrissey, and Kurt Heinisch, and Jerry Hughes, and Mario Addison, and even uh, the defensive line coach, Jacques Cesaire, um, you know, who was on the same defense as him last year in Buffalo. How, how are these guys dealing with it? You know, you can't compartmentalize everything at all moments uh, of a day or an hour or, or whatever it is. And so it takes a moment like this for you to kind of recall and reflect and understand like, damn, every moment you, you want to, you, you don't want to take it for granted, but it's impossible not to. It's just, these are reminders that you've got to absolutely try with every fiber of your being um, to, to relish in the moment and enjoy uh, the relationships that, that you have an opportunity to build uh, each and every day. Yeah, they say that after all of these type of thing happen or what I I, I get it, but it, if if you don't get that after we just dealt with two years of COVID, I don't know what to tell you. And hundreds of thousands, I mean, everybody's life was affected by somebody's sure. death, pretty much. So I mean, I just I, I'm like to me that stuff gets trite. I think what isn't trite is that these guys have direct relationships with this guy, and it's it's their job. It's what they do every single day. And you know, that's the risk and nobody knows it better. Like I said, than Derek Stingley, nobody knows that risk better. And, you know, we, we don't know as you and I are talking, we're talking on Wednesday afternoon. We don't know if they're going to play on Sunday. Do you want them to play on Sunday this week? Uh, it, should there be games this Sunday? I don't think so. Um, that's just kind of my gut feeling. Um, you know, you get to a certain point, it's the middle of the week, you know, preparation has been affected. Um, you know, teams, uh, have one less day of practice. Um, their minds aren't there. They've made grief counselors available to the players, the coaches, people that need them, even people that don't never even met DeMar Hamlin before. Um, just seeing something like that on a football field in your place of work, if you're a player, it, it, it can do something to you. It, there's, there's an effect there. And so I think just in that regard, um, for the lack of preparation, but I mean, never mind that, Robert. I mean, you know, look, this happened Monday night. We're talking here on a Wednesday afternoon and, you know, listening to all of the doctors for an individual to sustain something like this, a cardiac arrest, have to undergo CPR, the AED, having a breathing tube put down. Like there is a crucial period of time here after an incident like that, a 48 to 72 hour window that is crucial upon improvement. And yes, there's been some slight improvement, but I would, I would kind of just the way I feel, what I think, if I'm making the decision, if, if you can move, if you can move these games, move the games because you get to a certain point, And I think the deciding factor will probably be tomorrow morning. If I'm just guessing it's Thursday, there's supposed to be a game. It's the last weekend of the season. You're only a few days away from that. Move the game. You have a two-week buffer between the AFC and NFC championship games and the Super Bowl. Nobody gives a rip about the Pro Bowl. You know, maybe make it a week buffer between those championship games. 
in the Super Bowl or maybe push the whole damn thing back. I don't know how that's going to work contractually, television agreements, all the whole thing. Who cares? If we're if if what people are saying and thinking and all of that is true over the course of the last 48 hours, that none of that crap matters, um, just DeMar Hamlin and his health. Well, then you know what? Um, you know, put your words into action and let's see it because you want one, the very best and safest product you could possibly put on the field. Well, you have a really difficult time doing that when you're taking days of preparation away from, um, you know, your product. So I think that's a very slippery slope. And if it was up to me, I'm postponing it for a week. Um, and, and, and we can kind of move on from there. Either I'm going to talk to you Sunday or I'm not going to talk to you Sunday. We're, we're going to know here pretty shortly. Um, great to catch up with you. And uh, we're going to do this again. If we don't do it on Sunday, definitely a couple of days later. And don't forget to check out my show with Frank on Rockets Shop Shop. Everything talking about the Rockets uh, yesterday. Uh, we did a whole 45 minutes. So you're going to want to listen to that if you're a Rockets fan. Uh, thanks a so bunch, Sean. We'll talk to you soon. Yes, sir. Always enjoy it. You're listening to Houston Sports Talk. Hey, you can support the show by subscribing on YouTube and commenting on the videos. Listen to Houston Sports Talk on Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, and Google. Don't forget to tell a friend and share our show on social media. Spread the word, everybody. Thanks for listening.